The collective wisdom program that we run at MDA is based on the, the, the premise and principle that shared knowledge shapes the future. And what we do with these, among our other initiatives, which span everything from our websites through to a function like today, where we are trying to engage with the industry and have the industry engage between each other. And I think today we've got a, an interesting mix of both employer, contractor, and legal representatives that are active stakeholders and role players in our construction industry. And the idea is through these interactions that we share the knowledge that we get out of our own experiences and thereby hopefully enrich um, our own industry and make a positive contribution. One of the, 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 the inaugural lecture that we had last year was a lecture introducing and discussing the mechanics of adjudication as practiced under the Housing Grants Act. And we had uh, Dr. Robert Gatskill QC present the lecture. And that was followed by a panel discussion. The progression that we've had, or the, 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 innovate, the move that we've had subsequent to, to our lecture last year was, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, the introduction of the CRDB's prompt payment regulations, uh, which were put out towards the end of May for public comment. And these, in, these regulations are going to, once they are regulated into our, uh, our, our law, like in most other countries and jurisdictions where they've applied, are going to have a profound impact on the way we conduct ourselves and the way the industry works. And I think there are going to be some fundamental changes to industry practice and traditional approaches, not only to dispute management, but also to the ways in which contractors and subcontractors manage particularly their payment obligations between each other. And against the background of the introduction of those regulations, which have been a long way in the coming and a long time in the making, we thought that it would be appropriate to invite a speaker and an experienced professional who has had experience not only in the um, constitution of these of similar regulations, but also in the teething problems and the mechanics of these regulations being introduced into a construction industry. And with that in mind, we invited um, Professor Sundra Raju as well as Ms. Mrs. Rashta Rana to address us today. Unfortunately, Rashta has commitments and a trial that is overrun, which has now not made it possible for her to join us any longer. But <clears throat> with that in mind, we invited Professor Raju to come and talk to us about the implementation um, and the Malaysian experience and the impact of these similar prompt payment regulations and procedures into the Malaysian construction industry. And just over the last day or so, having discussed and, and, and opened discussions with Professor Raju, we, one of the things that strikes me are the alarming similarities between our industry and the practices within our industry as we currently understand them and practice, and what the Malaysian experience um, and the Malaysian industry experience was prior to the introduction of these regulations. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, Professor Raju is the current director of the Kuala Lumpur Regional Centre for Arbitration. He is also the present deputy president of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and with effect from 2016 will assume the presidency of the, Institute of Arbit the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. <clears throat> he is a past chairman of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in the Malaysian branch founding president of the Society of Construction Law in Malaysia and past deputy president of the Malaysian <coughs> Institute of Arbitrators and was a council member of the Malaysian Institute of Architects from 1990 through to roughly 2001. He is a chartered arbitrator, an advocate and solicitor of the High Court of Malaysia, currently non-practicing, and a, also a professional architect and registered town planner. <coughs> Professor Raju has extensive arbitration experience that includes over 200 appointments both in Malaysia and internationally and currently serves on numerous international arbitral institutions and organizations. 
So without further ado, I'd like to welcome and thanks, thank Professor Aju for joining us today. We're not going to follow a strict time program, but I would like to, during the course of the discussions and the Q&A session afterwards, please to encourage interaction and let's see if we can get some debate going. Because the regulations and the experience around these regulations are, um, I think, very, very pertinent to what we're going to hopefully be seeing in the next few months and early into 2016. Professor Raju, thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm actually very privileged to be here. Uh, I've visited your beautiful country uh, some 10 years ago on holiday, and I said I'll come back, but I never thought I'll come back to give a, a lecture. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's very interesting that uh, when I had a discussion with Walk yesterday, we were talking about, and I just realized how similar things are happening in two parts of the world, which we, you know, we are having the same kind of issues that are going on, particularly in the construction industry. And uh, so um, what I've done is that I put together uh, 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 a, a set of uh, a, a lecture slides to show you all uh, how we went about doing the Construction Industry Payment and Adjudication Act, which is your our equivalent to your prompt payment regulations. Ours is an act of parliament. And um, we were the fifth jurisdiction. There were, uh, I think there was England, there was Australian states, I mean, we take it as Australia, then New Zealand, Singapore, and then Malaysia. Then I think a number of other jurisdictions are now considering it. In fact, the Hong Kong, uh, they came in about two weeks ago, uh, CIC, that is their CIDB, to talk how we implemented uh, the, the, the act itself. Now, I, I'm going to actually talk about first how did we come about the act. And it's very, very interesting is that when we first started on this act, there was considerable con controversy because I think the, I, I was one of the skeptics who did not want the act, and I was part of the bar committee that was uh, involved at the time. So now the Typical problems that every construction industry, I think there's no construction industry that doesn't face this problem, is uh, conditional payment issues. You see, when you have an employer who is dealing with main contractors or main subcontractors, and they are dealing with subcontractors, because our, our, our industry are all similar in the sense that uh, it is a subcontracting system. Everything is parceled out and it's given out to people who can do the work. So uh, very few contractors actually carry out the work themselves or have the organization to do it. So I think uh, one of the problems that really come about from there is payment issues. When, and many of the employers, and including main subcontractors, uh, tend to put in conditional payment clauses. And that is a problem that was similar in the Malaysian PIM, uh, uh, construction industry. The Malaysian construction industry is actually a, a big engine of uh, of, uh, of part of the economy. In fact, we are a property-based economy. While we have a lot of commodities and all these things, people make money from development. I think that is the main thing, and construction is a part of it. And there are two types of construction that goes on. One is infrastructural construction, which is government is involved. Uh, and then the other one is private development, which is a lot of residential, uh, mixed development, commercial, and all these things. Now, uh, what has happened is that conditional payment in Malaysia before SIPA, I will call SIPA, which is our version of the prompt payment regulation, uh, was recognized by law. That means you could actually put in a conditional payment clause and it will be upheld. So pay when paid, paid if paid, back-to-back -back arrangements has always been there. So uh, in fact, that was really a problem in the industry because the guy who really suffers is the last guy down the line. The, 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 the employer doesn't realize that when he doesn't pay, a lot of other people down the line suffers and projects actually get into difficulty. So um, when we were talking about the act, one of the issues that came out was outlawing this particular arrangement. And of course, when, uh, when you want to outlaw something that is actually quite favorable to an employer or a sub, main subcontractor, there is a certain level of resistance, particularly when the law has recognized it. 
So it was done uh, um, quite with some difficulty. Uh, the, the real issue was the payment arrangements, the payment uh, uh, resolution clauses, uh, like for example, certification, subsequent to certification, you have, let's say, litigation, mediation, and all these dispute resolutions, ADR systems, seem to be inadequate. The main problem was that arbitration was seen to be costly, it takes a long time. The court system is, uh, I, I, I don't know whether you all have the same problem here, uh, the backlog of cases, you know, I mean, until uh, we had a reforming uh, uh, chief justice, uh, it would take as long as uh, five to ten years to get a, a matter resolved in the courts. I, of course, now uh, with the new arrangement, you have uh, fast track uh, 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 resolution of disputes through the courts in litigation, so they can finish it in nine months. But the quality is sometimes suspect because they are not sure. When you when you get actually a general lawyer who's a judge to decide, let's say, special uh, uh, construction matter or construction payment matter, he may not really make a good decision. Eh? Uh, so I think that was one of the other problems that we have. And of course, uh, the profession, you know, uh, the, the, the building profession in, in Malaysia, the architects, the engineers, we are all modeled uh, it, uh, uh, quantity surveyors. It's a very UK-based system. Eh? So you, whatever problems, I, I'm not sure about the South African system, but our system was basically you had specialized uh, consultants, and the 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 normally the the under the standard form contracts the SO would be the architect or the engineer, and uh, and then you, of course you have the quantity surveyor who do the valuations, and there is a process of certification which is not satisfactory. I think there was always this problem of uh, non-certification, the problem of under-certification the problem of sometimes uh, false certification. <laughs> I would put it like that. You know, I mean, we have to be frank about it. Eh? You know, I mean, we are, we are, I, I, while we respect professionals, but we do have issues there. Because the influence, the influence of the employer, I think has become stronger and stronger as uh, the bargaining power changes. Uh, I think in the old days, the profession had this uh, power, I think, uh, until Sutcliffe versus Takra, uh, that when that certification, the quasi-judicial power of the certifier was taken away, and it was recognized that the certifier does a professional duty, but essentially is the agent of the employer. Uh, uh, I think once that was taken away, uh, there was the rules started to change. So I think we have uh, problems where a certifier may not actually be truly what it is. In fact, I prefer the FIDIC form. There is no pretense anymore. You know, the certifier is actually. Uh, uh, the employer's representative. That solves the problem. So the employer becomes uh, uh, responsible for that. But I think uh, uh, the problem is that when you have a issue, let's say, with payment certification and all these things, uh, it, it has to be resolved either by litigation or by arbitration in the construction industry because that was the mode that was uh, generally accepted. Now, how did we come about with our, our act. Our act is called the Construction Industry Payment and Adjudication Act. And the act was actually inspired by the Latham report. And uh, Latham, actually, I was in the UK uh, doing a MSc. I was doing an MPhil in Manchester University in law and also an MSc in, uh, in uh, Leeds Metro. And at that time, in 1996, they sneaked through the, through the Housing Grants Act. Uh, the adjudication process. Nobody knew what it was. I, I remember Kepper was actually alluding to it, Philip Kepper, if you all heard of that iconic uh, person, who was very, very unhappy because he was never in, in the establishment as it is, uh, in the arbitration as establishment. So he decided that he had to have come a, a different process. And he managed to persuade, I believe, uh, to, to, to set up the statutory adjudication thing. And he went through a, a, a strange act, a housing grants act, which was something for uh, dilapidated uh, properties, is it? Uh, to actually regenerate them. And this process was put in. But what actually happened in the UK, if Tony Bingham has come here, he would have told you all that it started very, very slowly. Nothing happened, I think, for two years or three years. It was very, very quiet. Uh, and suddenly, the whole thing exploded. Uh, I, I think that that has been the nature 
of how adjudication takes root in every jurisdiction. If you talk about UK, it's like that. In Australian cities, uh, Australian states, it has been like that. In Singapore, it's also been like that. In New Zealand, it's been like that. So uh, what happened was that uh, the champion in Malaysia was the CIDB, our Construction Industry uh, Development Board. And they took, uh, they being responsible for the construction industry, they do a few things, uh, which is their core business. One is they actually uh, uh, regulate the construction industry by registering contractors. They also try to uh, improve the skill sets of the contractors and the quality of the work by training and all these things. And then I think this other part is to actually improve the efficiency in the construction industry. So they come out even dispute resolution mechanisms. That's how they, they came. And they managed to persuade the Malaysian government, together with the master builders. The master builders, Malaysian Master Builders Association is the contractors association. Uh, it's very, very strange. The employers association in Malaysia is called RADA, which is actually the, uh, it is uh, uh, essentially uh, consists of association of developers. Uh, they did not actually object to the, uh, to the proposal because I suppose they didn't understand what it was at that moment. It's always like that. When you don't know what it is, you don't object. Is it? You just wait until it explodes. Eh? And then, then you start tearing out your hand and you start fighting back eh? in, a, in, a, in, a, in a guerrilla way, I suppose. Eh? Uh, so I think uh, that, that's what happened. CIDB went ahead. Now the bill took a long time. I, I understand that's the same thing is happening here. Ours is an act of parliament. Yours is going to go through the CIDB act itself by way of a regulation. I, I suppose uh, there are different ways of doing things. It's very difficult, again, for our parliament to actually pass any act. Uh, for us to actually change our arbitration act in 2005, uh, it was set up in, we had an arbitration act in 1952, which was given by the colonial, uh, English colonial uh, uh, rulers and as an ordinance and became an act. Uh, and then uh, in 1957, we continued with that law until 2005. And in 1990s, we were trying to get this model law going, and we could not get it going because parliament did not have time. They seem to be fighting all the time in parliament. I don't know whether it's the same here, but you know, I've, I don't have a very good view of politicians, <laughs> so you must forgive me. Eh? I, I'm not very politically correct, but uh, they, they, they spend a lot of time doing things that are not really helpful. Eh? Uh, so to, their, their time is uh, very, very uh, valuable. So we managed to actually persuade them. Uh, you have to push it through. Uh, so CIDB managed to, and I, I think the alliance was formed through the Works Ministry. And the Works Ministry became a real stakeholder. Now, in Malaysia, uh, the government plays a very big sector in the construction industry development. In fact, the GLCs, the government league companies, the state-owned companies, have a very important role in the economy itself. And they do a lot of development and construction work. So uh, they... They come through uh, under the government in various other ministries, including, let's say, uh, uh, local development. They have, uh, let's say, uh, urban industries. But one of the, the, the important parts is the government also gives out a lot of work. Uh, a lot of work, as I mentioned, infrastructural works, and also a lot of uh, other kinds of work, like, for example, schools, uh, uh, lots of buildings for the army, security forces. Uh, I, I think it's the same here. Uh, so, um, they managed to convince the, the ministry. Now, at that time, the ministry was actually told that government was not going to be bound. This was going to be an act for the private sector. So, I think they went along. So, I, I will tell you all then the, the things, uh, the scenario changed and then the, the, the fight that came about. So, again, you know, the initial draft that we had prepared by CIDB was that there was no exemptions except for government, and it also uh, uh, applied to individual house owners. That means if you did a renovation, you are also caught under the Act. Again, you know, there is a debate whether it's the right thing. We were talking about it yesterday, whether it's right or wrong. Sometimes people build very big houses, you know. <laughs> Their property may be worth many, much more than a, 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 a small developer. Uh, but again, you know, if they are not caught, you know, we, 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 we do have an exemption there. Uh, the, Original uh, bill that came out talked, it was a very comprehensive bill uh, that 
provided essentially for every part of the process to be controlled and supervised by CIDB. And CIDB was going to set up a subsidiary. Uh, and it will actually then uh, uh, call, that, that subsidiary was going to become what is called the Adjudication Control Authority. And it will actually uh, 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 run the entire process from, uh, from registering, appointing, collecting monies, and, uh, and even uh, training. Uh, so that, that, that's where I think we are quite different from South Africa because as it started off as an idea of a bureaucratic uh, power structure. Somebody came out with this idea and he was going to control this process. So you will see when I explain to you the parts of the act, so it may not be the same as other countries or what is going to happen in South Africa. Uh, so I think uh, the current... Uh, uh, incarnation of uh, SIPA is that because I came in in 2010 as director and I, I, I was quite close to the government so I went to actually see the government and tell them that look you know we will do it uh, but before that uh, there was actually a lot of debate on who should be running the, the process so when I put in an alternative bill uh, which watered down the CIDB total control arrangement, but still uh, we couldn't actually get it away because you cannot change the bill very much. So um, we, the Kuala Lumpur Regional Centre became the Adjudication Control Authority and we proposed actually for a few reasons. One is that uh, we were in the, in the business of dispute resolution. Two is that we also were, uh, uh, we had industry experience because half our arbitration work was actually construction based although there's domestic and international, but uh, a lot of the work, about half, was uh, actually construction-based. And then uh, we also wanted to emphasize the fact that we were actually uh, independent and actually neutral. Now, the, the, the Kuala Lumpur Regional Center is set up as a mission, a diplomatic mission, an international body in Kuala Lumpur under ALCO, the African, uh, Asian African Legal uh, 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 legal consultative organization. So uh, what it does is that the Malaysian government entered into a host country agreement to set up this center to serve the Asia Pacific region. And one of the things that the Malaysian government did under the Arbitration Act, we managed to get it to become the default appointing authority. So I think that that was the first step. So the courts do not appoint the arbitrators when the parties cannot agree on the arbitrator. The, the center's director will appoint. So the, it only seemed natural that when CIDB came up with this act, we suggested that it should actually come under KLRCA. And we already have the experience, and we had the neutrality, and we could actually be also named in the act. That's what actually happened. So I think we, at the last minute when that happened, the CIDB was not very happy with us. But uh, it's done. You know, I think, uh, the, I, I think we have things to do. Uh, I, I talk about Section 33. Uh, we have to deal with two ministers. That, that's the complexity of the whole thing. There are two ministers, two ministries involved in this work, in, in our taking care of this, this, uh, this act in Malaysia. One is the law minister, who KLRCA is nominally under. We are an independent organization, but we report for funding purposes to them. The second is the works minister, which is in charge of CIDB. So this interplay is quite fascinating, especially the, the, the bureaucratic politics that comes out from that. Um, then I want to talk about regulations. Now, if I can actually ask you all to look at this. Do you all have a copy of this? In, because I just want to explain to you all, the entire regime in Malaysia is in this. In this uh, thank you very much. <laughs> is in this document, and if you have a look at it, uh, I, I will just run through the structure, and after that you will have a picture of how it was done. Uh, everyone has it? Uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, take it out from the info kit. Uh, it will be something like this. It's called the Construction Industry Payment and Adjudication Act 2012. Okay. 
Okay, yeah. uh, let me just run through, uh, look at the table of contents. You will find the first one is the act itself. It's an act of parliament. It's an act of parliament which has six, six parts to it. The first part is a description of the act. The second part is how is adjudication is going to be done, the payment disputes. Then third part is about the adjudicator. Then the fourth part, how are adjudication decisions going to be enforced. Then you have the adjudication authority. And then a general miscellaneous. That is the entire act. Now from the act, then we came out with a subsidiary legislation which the minister can is empowered to issue under the act which is called the regulations. See, your prompt payment regulations is coming under this. So we have an act of parliament which describes the entire adjudication process from start to finish, including enforcement. And then it also says that the minister can make regulations. And then we have a set of regulations that the minister has issued. That's the first structure. But that is not sufficient, we found. There is a gap between theory and practice, implementation. So we then came out with what is called the Kuala Lumpur Regional Center for Arbitration, Adjudication, Rules and Procedure to fill the gap. And you will find the rules set out very detailed, again, parts of it. And then you will find part two is B is procedure. We have certain procedures, for example, exemption. We set out a procedure how the exemption, because the, the act only says the minister can exempt classes of people. It doesn't say how he's going to do it. So we have to actually describe a procedure for that. And then what we have done in Schedule 1, we set out all the forms that can be used when to run the adjudication. For example, you will find that if you go to Form 1, is that how do you feel, uh, let's say, uh, initiate an adjudication? All the various forms are all here. So what we have done is that we have set up sample forms. The contractor or the claimant or the respondent can actually just fill up those forms. And we even give a sample uh, form for how an uh, adjudication decision should look like. So this is the entire scheme. Huh? It's all here. It's all here. If you just run through this, you will understand the entire scheme of, uh, of the Malaysian uh, Education Act. Now, to reach to this, there was a certain amount of debate. Now, the Act itself um, has a number of sections, as I mentioned. And um, we, we came up with the regulations. It's very interesting. You know, it's, it's a lot of negotiation that goes on. Of course, the Act itself was cut back. The original idea of the Act was uh, if there was actually a, an adjudication appeal, if a party does not agree to the adjudication decision, it will go to an appellate tribunal of three adjudicators. That was removed. I, I'm trying to tell you all some of the things. The other thing that a quirk about Malaysian Act, cost follows event, loser pays. That means if you, it, it is a double whammy. If you don't pay, and if you lose, which I would now show you all that the claimant has always won. In fact, our statistics now, they, they, you know, shows that 100% uh, win for claimants. Eh? The respondent has never won. Eh? Uh, it's either a full win or a partial win. That means they are great. That, that's what the early statistics are showing. I, I'll, I'll share the statistics with you all. Uh, but what happens under this act, which is different from the other acts, if you look at the Australian, uh, that... Normally, the adjudicator will carry their own, the parties will carry their own cost. But in our act, in the Malaysian act, cost follows event, the loser pays. So you not only have to pay if you are defaulted on a payment, you also have to pay the cost of bringing the thing against you to recover that. So it's going to be very painful. We can see the pain. Uh, what is going to happen? I, let, me, let me put it in a conceptual way. My own belief is that uh, it's going to improve, it's already improving the way people handle construction contracts. The first thing is that 
you will think of the construction contract as something that you must run properly. If you don't pay him, if you've got no money, don't start. See, that means you, you either you arrange, make your financial arrangements for payment or you don't start. Because if you start, you are really going to feel a lot of pain because you may lose halfway, you may get wound up or whatever it is. Eh? Because uh, there, there's so many provisions in there to enforce the adjudication decision. Uh, we, we did uh, a number of changes to the regulations. You know, uh, when I go through the regulations, there were provisions in the Act that was not clear. It says, okay, the construction contract has to be in writing. But what does writing mean? So instead of uh, 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 allowing it to come through the courts to define what writing is, of course, writing is in the Interpretation Act, what writing is, but we actually got the minister to issue a regulation of what the writing means. So, I, I mean, we use the regulation in that way. Uh, in, after all that debate, the Act was passed in 2012. Now, the Act was not implemented until April 15, 2014. There was a reason for it. There was a change of mind by government. They wanted out. They wanted to be exempted from the Act. It was very, very interesting. The people who pushed the act was the works ministry through CIDB. But when the act was passed through parliament and when they realized what the act was going to do, there was a, a, a pullback by particularly the works ministry who were to implement the, 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 the commencement. And they were saying that, look, you know, we want exemptions. Uh, we had written in into the act that to get an exemption, you have to get a recommendation through, through uh, KLRCA. So the KLRCA, you submit an application to KLRCA on your exemption, and then we will have to give a recommendation, and it's for the minister to accept uh, right or wrong or whatever it is, his, 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 his decision, his discretion to decide. But interesting about politicians is that normally they don't want to actually make that decision. They would rather like to hear a recommendation, which is what they want. So we actually made it very, very clear, KLRCA. We said that we will not recommend an exemption. In fact, it was in writing. So uh, I think that held back the act for two, year, two years. And finally, there was a compromise. In fact, there was had negotiations, and then there was a compromise. So I, I, will, I will explain that later. Now, uh, I want to now go through the act itself. The, uh, if I run through the act quickly with you all, uh, let me just run through the act. First, if you look at the act at page 12, it starts off with a statement of what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to facilitate in the preamble, in the, in the, in the preamble, you will sign on page 12, it's supposed to facilitate regular and timely payment, provide quick contemporaneous economic binding dispute resolution mechanism. It provides remedies for the recovery of payment and outlaws conditional payments. So I think this is exactly what the Act is supposed to do. Now, the first thing, if you look at it, part one is the scope and coverage of the Act. Now, if you look at the application of the Act, which is in part two, it applies to every construction contract. And if you look at the definition of construction contract, it's <coughs> comprehensive. Nothing escapes it. If you dig a hole, and it is uh, 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 in the form of construct, it becomes a construction contract. Uh, and the, the, the other thing about it is that this is a domestic legislation. It is territorial in nature, so it applies only to Malaysia. Now, there is actually debate in Malaysia on whether, how far will it go, because we are, we are basically, uh, also we have oil, and the oil is done offshore, and there's no exemption yet for the oil industry, the oil and gas industry, so the, the debate is now going on is whether those rigs and all these things outside that's being supplied and all these things are also covered under the Act. At the present moment, it is. Uh, I will explain to you all. And also, if the work is done in Malaysia, even if it's going to be supplied, let's say, to 
to be it's it's uh, the, let's say the 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 thing is being supplied in Malaysia, done in Malaysia, fabricated, and then going to be put in let's say in South Africa, then it is still covered under the Act. So it's a territorial uh, thing. It applies very very wide, but. I'm going to explain to you all that there is a philosophical difference here between our act and the English act. That's where the change really comes through. Uh, the, it, it applies to all contracts made in writing. And of course, we, we provided a circular through the regulation. Uh, and then we say, we explain what writing means. KLRC has been issuing circulars, best practice arrangements. To, to say why, uh, let's say if, if there is a lacuna, it's not very clear. We will say that we will actually accept this as a uh, as the practice that will be and register the case. So we, we have actually put down in writing. Now, parties. The Act says all parties will be... Uh, apply to all parties, so it includes also the government. And the government, there's two, uh, two types of government. We are, I think in South Africa, you would have prov provincial governments, it? state governments. We have a state government. They are very powerful also. They have certain rights. Uh, they deal with land, and, and they do a lot of things. And then we have the federal government, and then we have natural persons, and then uh, bodies incorporated. So, uh, but there is one exemption that is written into the Act, which is under Section 3. And if you look at Section 3, it says non-application. The Act does not apply to a construction contract entered by a natural person. The word is natural person, so the individual, uh, for a construction work in respect of any building which is less than four stories high, which is intended for your own occupation, your own occupation. So instead of saying residential property, the drafter went into this convoluted way of describing four stories, uh, own occupation, and it must be a natural person. So technically, if you are building a warehouse which is four stories high and you own it personally, then adjudication won't apply. So, you know, I think people are now trying to circumvent all these things, uh, they are, you know, I, 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 the, 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 the drafter, I think, was looking at big mansions, and he says that normally the house will not be more than four stories high. Uh, whether he has a leave or he doesn't have a leave or whatever services, he said, okay, but most probably the individual will actually contract it as an individual, uh, not, a, uh, not using a company or whatever it is. So I think he drafted it like that. I, I know that the, the, the person who drafted the act, the original act, is now a high court judge. Uh? <laughs> So it's quite interesting because it's a very loyally way of approaching. He's a quantity surveyor then uh, to now become a judge. Um, so I think that's the... Um, I did mention to you all that the negotiation that went on uh, to get the act implemented, uh, finally we came out with a compromise so that the act can be implemented. And the compromise was two exemptions for government. And uh, the first exemption under Schedule 1 is for any construction contract done by the government, eh? that means government as the party, uh, which involve emergency, unforeseen circumstances which relate to national security or security-related facilities. And they've identified, for example, army camps, water treatment plant. Uh, I agreed to this. I'll, for a simple reason, because the the actual exemption is limited, because it's limited only to government. So what you're going to have this very unsightly situation where government is a party, it, the act doesn't apply when, when it's building, let's say, a water treatment plant, where it's directly a party, but all down the line, the act will apply to the subcontractors, the, the, the main contractors, and all these things. So uh, we are seeing that now. We have a, 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 a one project that has come in where the subcontractor uh, is actually making a claim against a, 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 a main contractor who is contracting with the government. And the, 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 he, he's saying, look, I fall under this exemption, but it applies only to government. Our, our interpretation is going to court. 
our interpretation that it only applies to government. That government must be a party, and this adjudication does not involve a party, uh, a, a, a government as a party. So that was the first exemption. Now, there was some difficulty about uh, emergency work and unforeseen circumstances. We are going to leave that to be what it is. You know, we'll deal with that as it comes. The second schedule, which is more controversial. Now, a prompt payment act normally is to assist small contractors, is to assist uh, people, tradesmen, small contractors to get payment. And now, one of the exemptions that the government requested was they wanted a, a exemption first, they wanted uh, exempted uh, 20 million. There was such an outcry from industry that I think they backed off. And then they came back and they wanted the respond times and all these things, the time uh, lines that are set in the act to be extended. So we agreed. And this is a sunset clause. It ends by the end of this year. So we, we agreed to this so that it ends uh, at the end of the year so that we can get the egg going. And uh, it's very interesting, uh, the a number of government jobs that are coming in, and they get just a longer time to do their, their, their adjudication for them to respond to the, to the so it's, it's not really a problem. I, I don't see it, there's still an adjudication. Only thing is that, but, but I, I, told gum, I, I told the works, uh, uh, that's the, what is that, the, the, the chief secretary to the, uh, not the, the, the secretary general to the works uh, ministry. I said, you know, it just shows that the government is inefficient, you know. You just can't deal with this, you know. You should be able to actually respond to it, you know. You know I mean, everybody is expecting everybody to respond, the private sector. Then I think government should set the example. Now, the biggest ally that I had was actually the chief secretary to the government himself. The, the government, he, he said, uh, he was heading what is called Paman, Pemuda, Pemuda, which is a, a private sector and public sector task force to improve efficiency in the delivery systems. And he said that SIPA should apply to government because the argument that was brought up for exemption from government, they said that government pays within 14 days. But actually, they don't really pay within 14 days because sometimes they don't certify it. They under-certify it. They, those are the issues that uh, really uh, we had to deal with. Okay, um, so I, I think I'll, I'll move on there. Now, if you look at section 40, the minister is empowered to give exemptions under the Act. And that's how Schedule 1 came in, Schedule 2 came in. And uh, basically, he can actually exempt any contract, any class of contract, any or all of the provisions. Uh, the only safeguard is uh, the recommendation from us. So I think we play a quite an important role. So what we set up is a procedure. We say that we, it's actually now the refund, non-refundable fee should be 40,000 ringgit. We make it expensive for you to apply for, a, for an exemption. So if you apply for an exemption, you, you have to pay 40,000 ringgit for the application. Uh, which is uh, how much is uh, it's about uh, 10,000 US huh? uh, and then uh, you have to actually g give your name and uh, uh, address and you identify the, 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 the class of persons and all these things and then you have to say why you need that exemption and then you have to say what is the impact of that exemption to the industry and then what we can do is that we can actually uh, decline the application if it's incomplete if it's complete, we can. Uh, if it's incomplete, we can request for more information, and then we can review the application. And then we then recommend to the minister. And the recommendation to the minister is to either uh, uh, go ahead with the exemption, uh, with or without conditions, or decline the application. But after that, the minister makes the decision. It's very interesting. Our national oil company, Petrolnas, applied for a full exemption from. Uh, the upstream and downstream, the entire industry, oil and gas. Eh? So, which is actually the, the norm in the other legislation. Eh? If, if you look at the English legislation, New Zealand legis legislation, the Australian legislations, and also the Singapore legislation, oil and gas is exempted. But in the Malaysian legislation, it was not exempted. In fact, I recommended an exemption. The minister refused. The minister exempted partially. 
he exempted upstream but refused downstream. So you can see the interplay of uh, how this is going to... Uh, you see, we, are, we ourselves are not sure how it's going to be. Suddenly, the minister decides like this. Originally, he wanted an exemption for everything. Then now, he, he changes his mind. It's quite, uh, quite uh, interesting if I stand from this point of view. But uh, I, what it comes up to me now is that we cannot really be sure how the minister is going to decide. He will exercise his discretion. Um, I want to go to construction contracts. Now, OK, I, I, there, there's another quirk that happened. There was a drafting error in the Act. Uh, section 41 was the saving clause, eh? the last uh, uh, clause of the Act, the last section of the Act. And it says that nothing in this Act shall affect any proceedings related to any payment dispute under a construction contract which had been commenced in any court or arbitration before the coming of the operation of the Act. What this section basically says, that if you have started arbitration or if you have started litigation, then uh, you cannot go to adjudication. But you can go to adjudication and it applies to every construction contract. So what we realized from there, there was actually a drafting error that seemed to suggest the Act was retrospective. Uh, we, we were caught in the situation because Parliament had passed the Act. In fact, the, the problem when the Act was passed, we were not given the final copy. You, you, you all have the same problem? Uh, you know, where somebody actually has an Act, he, he's consulting you all, but you will never see the final copy until it's put before Parliament. Uh, that, that's what happened to us because it becomes under the Official Secrets Act, and then they put it in Parliament, and then we all see the final copy coming up from Parliament once it's passed. So this was too late. Uh, okay, KLRCA, we came out with a circular and said, look, you know, we interpret this clause as being, it applies to all construction contracts, but it applies prospectively to payment disputes which should crystallize after the commencement date, 15th of April. Do you all get that? So what it means is that we made it prospective. Right? That means it can be any construction contract, but the payment dispute must crystallize after that date. Then we will register the case. We issued a circular because we, we were worried about floodgates, uh, really floodgates, you know, because if it's retrospective, it just goes back six years limitation. Now, it was challenged. Uh, the, in fact, I, it's very, very interesting. You know, uh, uh, when, when we issued the circular, I got a number of calls from my lawyer friends. They said, how can you do this? You cannot do this. You shouldn't do this. You know, it's bad. You should let the courts decide. You know? I said, no, no, we, we have to actually do this because we have to have clarity in how we implement the thing. Uh, so that if, if it's challenged, then if the court decides, we will follow what the court decides. But in the meanwhile, we take an administrative position. Uh, and um, one party took me to, took this institution to judi for judicial review. Of course, we knocked it out because uh, KLRCA has immunity under the uh, 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 diplomatic immunity under the Privileges Act. Uh, so we, we knocked it out. I said, I'm not going to go down the path. Uh, unless you go to the construction court. In Malaysia, we have what is called the construction court, which is similar to the TCC in the UK. So that court specializes for adjudication disputes and arbitration. So, so, and finally, it was filed there, and there was a decision. And the court ruled that the act was retrospective. This provision made the act retrospective. 15, uh, uh, from 15th of April 2014, it goes back six years limitation. And it went up to the Court of Appeal, and recently the Court of Appeal has held the provisions. Now, actually, there is, there is a problem, because we had to deal... Uh, normally, when X become retrospective, it has to be... Uh, you have to look at whether it, it can only deal with procedural rights. It shouldn't deal with substantive rights, isn't it? Right? You should, because somebody enters into a contract, he has already made that bargain, he has performed the bargain, and then you cannot actually go back and say his bargain is wrong. See, isn't it? So I think that that was a problem we had to, and, and we are waiting for the judgment by the, by the Court of Appeal, but the, the High Court uh, sort of glossed over that and said that this is a social legislation which has to be followed. And uh, the provisions that I want to actually bring to your attention is actually the conditional payment provisions. 
because you outlaw conditional payment on the 15th of April, isn't it? When the act came into force. Now, if the act goes back six years, then conditional payment has been outlawed for six years before. So that is a problem for, I think, a lot of people who have entered into contracts who suddenly did not know that. The other one, in section 36 in the act here, has uh, what is called default payment clauses, section 36, I think, yeah, 36. When a contract is silent about payment arrangements, the act prescribes how the payment is supposed to be made. It's supposed to be monthly payments. And uh, though those the condition, it's is like, is like the sales of good acts. You have certain implied clauses. There will be these clauses will be implied into that, uh, into, that, uh, into that contract, the construction contract that is silent. So that is, again, substantive is it, in nature. So anyway, we have accepted it. Now, I'm getting an average of five cases a day. Uh, every day, in fact, I was spending my time uh, appointing adjudicators. So we have set up a rotation system. So it, it's like it's a, a total floodgate is going on. So we, we, are, we, are, but we are ready to handle it. Uh, at the present moment, I think we have about 100 cases. So it should shoot up to about, let's say, 300 cases. And then we are expecting about 600 cases uh, in a year in, uh, during peak time. Uh, we don't know. I, I just don't know what is the figures going to be like. Uh, we, we, we can only organize ourselves. Eh? So I, I'm giving you all the, 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 some of the things that you shouldn't do. <laughs> draft properly. <laughs> and, and debate the draft very early if you can participate in it. Eh? Quickly get it done. Eh? And don't, don't allow somebody to, uh, to hide behind it. Eh? Okay, uh, the KLRCA has been set up as the adjudication authority. And what is our, uh, our, our role? It is stated in the regulations. We have to maintain a register of adjudicators. We have to determine a code of conduct. We have a code of conduct, which is uh, all adjudicators must agree to if you want to be on the panel. Uh, we have to provide training, uh, and we conduct examinations. We have a five-day course. We certify, uh, ac we accreditate adjudicators. In fact, it is the only accreditation recognized at the present moment in Malaysia, which is uh, very interesting. In fact, I wanted to diversify. Uh, I just wanted to be an examination body. You know? I didn't want to do the training, but nobody wants to do the training. It's harder work. You know? So the university should do it, but I think you know, but they don't want to do it. And, and the private sector is, is, you know, is not enough. So it's quite, quite interesting that you know, the, the, the center, the adjudication authority has to do the training. Determine the fees, and then hold the fees. In fact, we totally administer the adjudication from start to end. That means from the appointment of the adjudicator, we follow the timelines, we collect the fees, we hold the fees when the adjudicator makes the decision. And if the adjudicator does not make his decision within the time frames allowed, he, the decision is void. He's not entitled to his fees. We are the control mechanism. So we will actually will check. In fact, today I was looking at my email and one of my colleagues is writing to an adjudicator, the decision is due tomorrow. And he's reminding him, he said, look, you know, where is the decision? We now, he quote, you know, we have, we have a standard letter, standard email that says that under the provisions of this, 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 if you do not submit the thing, you will not be entitled to your fees. And also, uh, your, the decision will be void. Is it? And, and actually, there is also a, a, a provision that if you do not actually uh, deliver in our code of conduct, we will remove you from the, from the panel. So I think quite strict. We are, we are, we are, we are trying to... So there is section 32 that empowers uh, the, the KLRCA as the adjudication authority to provide, one is administrative support, the other one is to set uh, competency standards and criteria for the adjudicator. Then we are supposed to set standard terms, which you'll find in the rules, and fees of the adjudicator. And then the adjudication rules and procedure, we can do that, and then we appoint the adjudicator. We are the default appointing authority. It's very, very interesting. Well, the parties can agree on the adjudicator. In Malaysia, it seems to fail. The most of the adjudications are default appointments. In fact, uh, what is happening? The parties can't seem to agree on the adjudicator. Uh, but I, I fault it on the mechanism because we have a default mechanism. If there was no default mechanism, if it was a bit more cumbersome, they had to go to a different authority or. Uh, a, a disparate number of authorities, then people will agree on the adjudicator. 
But I suspect because we, we have a very clear system, if you don't agree, you go to this. And I think a lot of the advisors to parties, especially if they are going to lose or win or whatever it is, they may not take the, 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 the chance of advising you choose this adjudicator or that adjudicator. adjudicator. You might as well just go to the authority. The authority will appoint somebody, and that's good enough. Huh? OK, I'm, I'm now going to explain the actual process itself. Now we have section five. Now, now before that, I explained to you all that it applies to all construction contracts. The only exemption is section three that says that it doesn't apply to a natural person building a four-story building, less than four-story for his own occupation. Now, when you look at the construction contract definition under section four, you look at construction works and construction work contract, it covers everything. Everything. In fact, uh, it, 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 there is no, I, I cannot imagine any uh, construction work that is not covered by this act. Then, but I would like to draw your attention to the word payment. Uh, most acts in, uh, in let's say, in, uh, in England, England covers all disputes. That's the way they describe it, all disputes, uh, uh, everything. Uh, in, uh, in, the, in Singapore and in, uh, in Australia, and I think also New Zealand, they talk about progress payments. In Malaysia, there is a description of what payment is. What is the scope of the act? So if you look at payment, it says it means payment. Payment means a payment for work done or services rendered under the express terms of the construction contract. Straight away, the scope of the act is just narrowed to not progress payment, not all disputes, but payment for work done and services rendered under the express terms of the contract. What does that mean? Reimburse work. That means you are going to be paid for the work that you do. So it will include variations. It will include work done. Now the debate is, would loss and expense be included? Would damages definitely is not included? Okay, the, the, the idea behind this definition of reducing the scope of the act is actually cash flow. The, the argument that was actually that brought about from all disputes, the original design of the act was for all disputes. It was actually because of the bar objecting. Uh, it was brought down to only a reimburse costs was because it was felt that the construction industry will be served better by having a process that allows cash flow. There was another debate that went on during the formulation of the act, whether final payment should be in, final accounts. And I think final accounts uh, was agreed because through this definition, um, as long as the work is done, you get paid for it. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a compromise. While the act is very, very broad in its scope, in its application, it becomes very narrow. So uh, uh, the first adjudication that we got uh, was against the government for a final account that was not paid for five years. Which was not, I mean, the final, final accounts are not done. Basically, nobody does a final account. I mean, I don't know about practice in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, South Africa. In Malaysia, the consultants will do a second last payment, and then they will actually uh, wait for the final payment. They will make all those things, and then when the retention money is done, they will release the retention money, and they, especially in the government, they will sit on it until all the documents are lost and all this, and eventually it's never done. So uh, what happened was that f after five years, this, this party put in for a final account. Uh, so uh, they structured their own version of a final account. That's quite interesting. Eh? So it was put against the government, and the government lost. The government lost. It's quite interesting because I, I, I thought that that was the first uh, bite that really sent the message. That uh, it was, what, 30 million ringgit, the final account, which was stuck. So he got paid a, a, a partial payment of all the work done. 
He didn't get the prolongation cost. The adjudicator didn't allow that. He didn't allow the damages, the loss and profit and all these things. But he allowed work done, variations, and all the, the reimbursed costs, all the, the actual work payments. So I think that, that was good. Um, the, so I, I think then we now go to the process itself. Huh? The process itself, you have to go to section five. Our act thinks of a two-stage process. One is what I call the letter of demand process. You demand for the payment. And then you decide whether you want to actually go on to the next stage. Then you start the adjudication process itself. So section five, if you go to section five, it talks about a payment claim. And a payment claim, he says that uh, here the party is described an unpaid party may serve a payment claim on the non-paying party. The, the other problem with this act is the nomenclature. The parties change. Suddenly from non-paying, unpaying, you know, uh, the unpaid party, then non-paying, then after they become claimant, then become respondent. So you have to be very careful. So you have to look at the stage where it's involved. So in your mind, you have to say, okay, this is before the adjudication starts. There is a letter, a, a, a process of demanding the payment. And when you demand the payment, it's under section 5. And you say that you serve a payment claim. That's what it's called. That means you notify the, uh, the party that I'm not paid, and you has to be in writing. And we have set out a schedule on how it should be done. There is a form how you should fill up. We are assuming some of them are not going to be represented so that they can actually fill up the form themselves, which is happening also. People are not represented, representing themselves, coming to the adjudicator, small claims. Uh, so uh, amount claim and the due, demon, uh, due date for the payment, and then identify the cause of action, including what is the provision of the contract that relates to the payment. And then you describe the work and the services that you have rendered. It includes supply contracts and also consultancy contracts. And one of the things that we also notice, uh, I don't know how many of you all are consultants here, a lot of consultants are availing themselves to this and claiming their fees through this system instead of arbitration or litigation. When they have done the work, they just put in their, their claim and they are using this process to get back their, 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 their professional fees uh, because it's covered under the, the, the act, including because a construction work, construction contract is also described as a consultancy service and a supply contract for, 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 for uh, building materials is also included. So, and then uh, the last statement, which is very, very important, you must make a statement that this payment claim that you're making is under SIPA 2012, straight away to activate this mechanism. Then the section six comes in, is the payment response. Now the payment response is very, very interesting because Unlike Singapore, when you get a payment claim, Singapore says if you do not make a response, then it is deemed admitted. So the, 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 in Singapore, it's very, very strict. That means if you don't pay and then you do not make a response at that time, then it's deemed admitted. Whereas in Malaysia, it is, if you do not make a response within the 10 working days, it's deemed not admitted. <laughs> so, okay, what is the problem with that? The problem with that is that you will then have the adjudication proper starting after that because this is a letter of demand. I now make a, a claim against you. You have a choice of either paying me, paying part payment, disputing it, but if you keep quiet, you have not admitted it. The court had to grapple with this issue of whether keeping quiet will entitle you to put a response later. That means you ambush later. And I think we just had a ruling now. The court basically said that if you do not respond, although you say deemed uh, not admitted, you are not entitled to put in a, a defense. You, you can only ask for strict proof which is, uh, I, I think it's, it's a correct decision. You know, I, I feel that you just can't get away by saying that I don't want to do anything. I wait until the end. And uh, the, the last bit is only five days. You know? So you can really ambush the, 
the, the claimant at the end if you put in. So I, I think that's... Uh, then, okay, you, when this part is over, you can actually go to sleep. You don't have to do anything. You put in your payment claim, you get a payment response or you don't get a payment response, then you can just stop. You have initiated the, the adjudication, you have told them, so you can actually go to sleep, not do anything. The next thing that can happen is section eight. This is where the adjudication really starts. You then serve a written notice of adjudication. If you want to start at the adjudication, let's say you have not been paid, there is no satisfactory answer, that is the point where the adjudication starts. By you serving a written notice of adjudication and the written, not, the written notice of adjudication, you have to register with KLRCA. And then we have a registration fee because we are administering it. Then you agree to appoint an adjudicator within 10 days. Parties have a right to agree. You have 10 days to agree to an adjudicator. If the parties cannot agree to an adjudicator, then they write to the director of KLRCA and I would appoint. And I've got five days to appoint. They've got 10 days to decide, <laughs> to appoint, and they, they cannot agree. Then when it comes to me, I've got five days uh, to appoint. And that's really tension. You know? I must tell you that, you know, because uh, bas basically we, we don't want to test this thing. What happens when the director does not appoint the adjudicator within the five days prescribed under the Act? And I suspect that the adjudicator will have no jurisdiction. So there, there's a problem, a lot of uh, uh, responsibility on the center. So what we have done is that we have a ro roster of adjudicators on our panel. We have a rotation system. We have an experienced set of adjudicators and we have a, 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 a new, a new, I mean, inexperienced adjudicators. So they both go on a rotation basis. Now. It depends you know, how much you pay the adjudicator to get the people. This is very important, I must tell you all that. When you look at your system, make sure you pay the adjudicator well. You know, if you pay the adjudicator poorly, you will have, I mean, people will train, they will come and do, you may not get the best. And those people who are doing the, uh, the good work, they will do it as a favor to the institution. After that, quite reluctant. So I have a situation where they will reject it. They will look at the claim amount is too small because we are paying by ad volarum. And then uh, uh, they, they, they will say, okay, I, I'm not free. Or you know, I'm, they, they'll make some excuse. And then we have to go to the next guy, to the next guy, to the next guy. So I think, again, you know, when you set up the regime, make sure that you have a reasonable payment to the adjudicator. In fact, we had this problem now because the ministry knocked down our fees so low that uh, we, we had to actually set up a recommended set of fees. Um, now, uh, again, once you appoint the adjudicator, let's say I, when I appoint the adjudicator, there's a recommended set of fees, isn't it, in the, in the regulations. There is also, in our circular, we have given a, uh, no, one is the tariff fee, which is prescribed by the regulations, and then there is another set of fees by, the, by the, our circular, a recommended fee, because we said the tariff fee is too low, that the, 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 the KLRCA recommended the fees the parties should apply. But despite that, the parties can agree on the fees with the adjudicator. And they got uh, uh, a certain number of days. The problem is that within 14 days, he, they must come to, to agree on the fees because he must issue a direction as regard to the fees. Now, what we find that all the parties, except for very few, are refusing to agree to the adjudicator's fee. It is a situation where one is a reluctant party, one is a party who initiates it, claimant. So the respondent inevitably does not want to agree to the fees. When they agree to the fees, they will agree to the tariff fees. So it is a problem. It is a problem. In fact, I, I have to go back to the minister and say, look, this is not going to work. You know? We have to actually change this thing. Uh, so far, people is new. People want to get experience. People will do it. But after that, I think you know it's not going to be a f uh, free service, you know, or it's going to be a reduced service. You've got to be, you've got to pay the adjudicator reasonably well. Uh, so now, the adjudicator then gives a uh, a direction on the fee scales, 
and he will actually also uh, uh, give directions on how the, 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 the process will be carried out. But everything is set out in the Act. You must follow the timelines unless parties agree to vary it. So the claimant must serve the adjudication claim within 10 working days. And then we have, a, we have a rule that you must give a copy to us, basically, within a certain time. And then the respondent then serves a response within 10 working days. And then the claimant has a option of serving a reply within five days. So it's 10, 10, 5. In the meanwhile, there is the adjudicator. The adjudicator has a lot of power. But one thing we realize, this power will never be used. He will have a lot of power. He, he, he can basically do, you know, when I see the, the provisions under the Adjudication Act, under Section 24 and 25, you just realize he's almost like an arbitrator. He can call, he can call uh, discovery, he can order discovery, he can actually ask for evidence, he can hold a <coughs> hearing. But one of the things that we found is that most of it is becoming documents only. Because there is no time. The adjudicator may, even if he calls a hearing, he does not actually go through the traditional way of hearing each party. He may do by way of interrogatories. He will ask the questions inquisitorially and get the answers, get both parties to do that. And uh, of course, we have a requirement that the uh, the adjudicator must, uh, what is that, uh, must f abide by the rules of natural justice. And we just uh, had a case uh, which is actually cautionary. Eh? Adjudicators sometimes, some, some of them are lay people in the sense that they are not lawyers in the sense, and they are technical people. They are so used to dealing people in a very, uh, I mean, I, I think architects and engineers and quantity surveyors, you try to solve the problem. For you, the word of natural justice is something that is very loyally. You know? So, but there's one situation where we had one adjudicator. He wanted certain information. He called one party unilaterally and asked for the information. Did not tell the other party. Normally, we, we, we will say that you should write an email and you should copy to the other side or write to both parties and ask for that information. What he did, he made a phone call. Now, he, his, his decision, in fact, is the first decision that has been set aside in Malaysia, has been set aside for breach of natural justice. Because there are four parts uh, under the Adjudication Act where a adjudication decision can be set aside. And uh, the adjudication decision can be set aside. Let me get you all the provision. The, the, it's, it's Section 15. Section 15 talks about improperly procured adjudication decision. Uh, when you look at Section uh, uh, 15, he says, the first thing is that it can be set aside, adjudication decision in Malaysia can be set aside if the adjudication decision is improperly procured through fraud or bribery. That's the first provision. Second provision, denial of natural justice. Third provision, the adjudicator has not acted independently or impartially. And the fourth one, the adjudic adjudicator has acted in excess of, uh, of jurisdiction. Do you all realize something here? There is now talk about merits of the decision. An adjudicator in Malaysia can decide the decision as long as he answers the right question. His decision cannot be questioned on the merits. Do you all... oh, sorry, am I talking? So, you know, actually a lot of people, you know, that, that is why I keep on telling my adjudicators, most important is to answer the right question. Don't answer the wrong question. Don't answer things that you have not been asked to answer. Don't go beyond what you are supposed to do. Because if you look at what you are supposed to do, this is the only thing that you should be worried about. And the two things that are really now being challenged is breach of natural justice and jurisdiction. And there is another provision. There is no provision of competence, competence under this act. You all know what is competence, competence. Huh? Competence, competence is that an adjudicator, or in, in arbitration, there is this notion 
that an arbitrator can actually investigate his own jurisd jurisdiction and come to a decision. That means the, he can, they, uh, under unsuitable model law, the arbitrator can be asked, uh, look, uh, uh, I say you have no jurisdiction, and then you, he says, okay, uh, you, uh, because you have no jurisdiction, because let's say underlying contract doesn't work up, the, 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 the arbitrator will say, look, there's a notion of separability, and now I will make that decision to rule whether I have jurisdiction or not, just like what the judges do. Under the Adjudication Act, SIPA, that provision is not there. I don't know how you're going to deal with it in South Africa because that is actually a very interesting thing because a lot of people are going to attack on that. If you look at the English decisions, it's all about jurisdiction, mostly. So, in fact, I think there was something that we, we should have thought about, how to handle that. In fact, I think the, the, the important thing is... Uh, Either you give it to to, uh, to the adjudicator to decide. In fact, most adjudicators are being trapped by the respondent or whatever it is and say, look, I say you have no jurisdiction. This is something that you shouldn't do. So what do you say? Do you go on and doing it? So in fact, what we, we tell is that just ignore them. Ignore, just answer the question, proceed and finish up because there is a provision under section 27 of our act, which says that the adjudicator can proceed to make a decision under section uh, section notwithstanding section 27.3, notwithstanding a jurisdictional challenge, the adjudicator may, in his discretion, proceed and complete the adjudication proceedings without prejudice to the rights of any party to apply to set aside the adjudication decision under section 15, or oppose the application to enforce the adjudication decision under section 28.1. So that's what we have been telling the adjudicators. Eh? Just proceed. Eh? Just make a decision. You are hired to make a decision. Just don't freeze. But it's very interesting because these are early days. So we are seeing very, in fact, I was telling Wag that the, the behavior of some of my most experienced adjudicators are quite <laughs> astounding <laughs> because they are all learning how to handle things. Uh, you know, and particularly when they are caught with things and they're not very sure of their power, uh, they have to deal with it. So we, we are now talking about the training programs where we start to explore the possible scenarios of what could happen. Eh? So um, what we, uh, adjudicator can call for meetings, he can do all kinds of things, ask for documents and all these things. But what we realize is that most adjudicators are not doing that because they don't seem to have the time. And they also do not have the confidence level, I suspect, to handle the parties, particularly when parties are hostile. Maybe one party is hostile. So they don't know maybe perhaps to handle it. So we are not very clear about how is that. We're going to observe that. And then, uh, of course, the adjudicator must follow the rules of natural justice. And we have a code of conduct that we have set for adjudicators. Uh, the next section is quite important. That um, th once the reply has come in, uh, the adjudicator has 45 days to actually deliver his decision. This is very long. It's the longest of all the jurisdictions. I, I don't know how y'all are going to set it, but many, I, I think here is 28 days to maximum 42, isn't it? Eh? I was reading the prom regulation, the proposed regulations. That means it cannot go more than 42. Under our act, it goes up to 100 days. The average adjudication will last about 100 days. Uh, the reason was the timelines were not changed when the scope of the act was actually reduced. Uh, the, the, the authorities decided to keep maintain the same timelines. Uh, so, if you do not make the decision within that 45 days, the decision is void. Uh, we, we think you know, that what will happen is that the parties, uh, the adjudicator is not entitled to claim his fees. He may not even have the immunity under the, under the act because he has not performed his part of the contract. So there is a little bit of danger for adjudicators who are not diligent. And sometimes when parties ask for extension of time, you must make sure that you also ask for a corresponding extension to deliver your adjudication decision. So I think if you are not experienced enough, you may get caught there. Then um, the decision itself must be in writing. Uh, it must be with reasons. 
It must be with reasons, but actually the reasons are not important huh? if you look at it because it's not going to be decided on the merits. Uh, so you, you just have to say, I allow this because it's, uh, I don't know, whatever re reason you give, but unless you answer the wrong question, you dealt with a matter that you're not supposed to deal with. The real problem is this. Under the payment definition of work done for service or services rendered under the express terms of the contract, the work done and services rendered, it becomes very important. So when you're looking at a final account, you have to identify which is the items that are work done. That's where actually adjudicators are getting caught. We have to identify which is the work done and you have to answer those questions and allow it or don't allow it. And then the way we have told the adjudicators under our training program, the items that you don't allow, you just say that it doesn't fall under the scope of SIPA. I'm not allowing this item because it doesn't fall under the scope of SIPA. SIPA, SIPA is a payment uh, construction industry payment and adjudication act. That's the way we are telling them to do it. So far it's been working. Uh, that's when you actually make a payment. This is a bit more complex than, than uh, a usual regime it is. Eh? Then um, you have to state the adjudicated amount, and then you have to state the time and the manner of payment, and then uh, you have to decide on cost. The cost must follow event. And what we have done in our, our schedule, we have allowed a description uh, on how a decision looks like. We have actually uh, uh, set out a, a framework for the decision itself. It's in form, sample format of a decision, it's form 15. How does a decision, what are the main components that you should have there? So in fact, we are telling adjudicators, just follow this structure. But uh, it's uh, interesting, very experienced adjudicators who are arbitrators seem to write very long. We are expecting decisions, let's say, should be about, uh, for the amount of money that you're paid, you should have about 10 pages, is it? People are writing about 100 pages, 150 pages. It's uh, amazing, you know, they, they, and then they complain they don't get paid very well. So, so <laughs> you're caught, but anyway, they are quite diligent, but I think sometimes more you write also, you, you, you're also falling into a, into a possible trap of being, uh, saying things that you don't have to say. So, uh, and then you must fix the cost. Now, under Section 13, what is the effect of the adjudication decision? It is actually temporary and immediately binding. That means pay first, argue later. You have to pay first. Uh, in fact, uh, if you do not actually, you have to pay within 15 days, uh, within, uh, 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 within the time that, that is prescribed. And then, unless it is set aside or is stayed, now, there is a provision for the court to stay the adjudication decision, but we think that it will be hardly used because there is a provision under that staying provision that the adjudicated amount must be paid into escrow to KLRCA. So if, let's say if you say that there is a possibility of insolvency, that the person is going to run away or whatever it is, then you can actually ask for a decision to be stayed, but that amount must be paid into KLRCA to hold in trust until the, 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 the matter is actually resolved. So I think that, uh, again, you know, we, we've been talking, we had training programs for the judges. When we, when we did this, uh, this act, we had a number of training programs for the judges on how the act is going to be played out, especially their role. Uh, we, we said that basically they, they have to be very pro, uh, uh, pro the act to make it work, you know, because if they actually interpret it in a negative way, then that is why I think we are having such an amazing thing that they can see it retrospective, they can close down, the, the, if you do not give an answer, uh, it doesn't mean that you can actually uh, raise a defense, uh, you know, you, uh, you must just, you can only ask for strict proof, that kind of thing. So uh, it is to a large extent postponed, is it? Uh, because of the training that we did with judges, the judiciary, in fact, the Chief Justice himself attended the course. Huh? He stayed there for two days. Huh? He, he, it, 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 because he came, everybody else came. <laughs> so they all didn't go home, you know, because that was quite interesting because he, he was very committed and he, I, th I think the message has gone down. Uh, and Section 15 also, as I mentioned just now, has very limited time, grounds to 
actually uh, set aside the decision. And then um, the important thing is like an arbitration. You can enforce it like a judgment of the High Court. So an order of the High Court, Section 28. Now, the other provisions are the self-help provisions of, the, of uh, what a, 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 non, a, a claimant can do. A claimant who has not been paid can actually suspend work or slow down the, uh, the progress of work by giving notice saying that, look, you know, you're not paying me on this, uh, uh, on this decision. If you're not paying, I'm going to suspend work. Because the common law right is not there, because you cannot actually stop work or suspend work or slow down under common law. Even Malaysia is the same provision. Eh? So this gives you a, a new right under the uh, enforcement side. Uh, and the interesting thing that they can also be under this provision, under Section 29, if you go and look at it, you can also claim loss and expense for slow, suspending and slowing down. So I, I think it's, it's quite effective. This is, this is normally more effective than, uh, than going to the court to try to claim. Of course, it takes time to go to the court to register it, get, it, uh, get the order out and all these things, and then try to let's say, go for distress order or whatever it is, garnish or whatever, but it's going to take time. There's also a provision for direct payment from the principal. You, let's say you're a subcontractor and you have a payment decision, a decision, adjudication decision. You can go direct to the principal above and if there are monies owed to the contractor, you can ask the principal to pay you. So that's another provision that's under Section 30. Uh, so running back, Payment claim, overview, eh? payment respond, this is the letter of demand arrangement. Then you serve the adjudication notice, you appoint the adjudicator, you either agree on the adjudicator or you go to the center for the appointment. You then submit the adjudication claim. The respondent submits a response. And it's basically, if you don't submit, you just move on to the next stage. Then the claimant submits a reply. The adjudicator goes on with it. He may have uh, some hearings or whatever. Most of them, they don't. They just straight away, they make a decision. Section 12, that's, a, that's the entire process. So it's, a, it's all supposed to be complete in, within 100 days. I think in your system will be 42 days maximum. And they are talking about an average of 28 days. It is tough. Right? You've got to pay the guy well. <laughs> you could torture him. You know? Because basically, you know, I, I noticed something about what is happening. The adjudicators actually drop everything just to handle it. And if the time frame is shorter, they have to drop everything else also. But the real pressure is on the councils who have to deal with it. And I think you know, people are not handling it well because the time frames are very, very tight. And uh, you, you see, uh, a lot of people don't keep good records and all these things. They sometimes don't know how to respond within the time. Uh, particularly now you say that you must respond. You're not, you, don't, you cannot actually uh, avail yourself of the right of bringing it later. So uh, uh, it, the, we are finding... Uh, of course, we are seeing cost orders and all these things, and we are looking at it. One of the people who are really playing a very big role are claim consultants. Eh? They are formulating claims. They are preparing the thing. They are charging very high fees. Eh? The lawyers don't seem to be doing that well eh? because they are actually working very fast. They are working very fast. That's only so much they can charge. And then they move on. And then the, 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 the adjudicator is paid quite poorly. So the only beneficiary I'm seeing from our system seems to be the claim consultants. I mean, in terms of, uh, of the payments that they are claiming. So, I mean, it is not a judgmental thing. I'm just saying the way it is arranged. So what have we done? Uh, what we have done is that, as I said, that we have set out the procedure for registering of uh, adjudication until the decision. And then we have suggested 17 types of forms, how you can use it, uh, standard forms. Then we have also set up a procedure for exemption. And then we have put out a standard terms of appointment of adjudicators and the code of conduct and also an administrative fee structure. The fees are very, very low. So 
Okay, uh, I think uh, what is happening is that we are, these are the queries that we get. Uh, every day we are, you know, we are like a hotline. You know? We have a hotline there, somebody answering questions. I, I always tell them, please don't give them legal advice. Just tell them to go away. You know? But tell them, <laughs> just fill up the thing. Don't come and disturb us. You know, they, they come and ask us whether our claim will succeed. <laughs> so we say we don't know. You know, uh, so you know, this is a problem of being an administrative uh, institution, everything coming on us. So what we have been doing is that uh, we have been issuing circulars. I think you all have seen the circulars. We have issued circular 1A. 1 then became 1A because the court made the decision. That was the first circular, remember, when I talked about the crystallization of the payment claim subsequent to, to uh, after the date of, uh, of, uh, of commencement. Uh, and then I said that... Uh, that earlier it applies to all construction contract, and but we will only handle it when the payment claim crystallizes after 15th of April, and then the court struck it down. So we issued circular number 1A to say we will follow the court. <laughs> we will we will actually uh, uh, register all claims as long as it's a construction contract within six years of the Act 15. So in effect, the Act goes back six years. Eh? It's amazing, right? That's why I say five five adjudications a day, I'm getting, and then I think in about in about six months' time I'll be getting ten, I think, every day. So you know, basically we have just we have to handle it by way of of, of systems. You know? We cannot handle it. We cannot have too much human intervention. It just has to. Uh, we just have to have a way of uh, appointing the people. Now uh, the recommended fees that we have come out with because the fee as I mentioned earlier was low. And uh, I think this is something that you all really must look at. This, this is something you, I, I think is non-negotiable. Uh, the problem is that Singapore kept its low fee, its fee very low. That's where this idea came from, from the ministry people. They said, look, the Singapore Ministry of Works, C controlling CIDB, has set the fee very low. Why should Malaysia actually set the fee very high or have a free flow? But pe people can decide. But when you have a tariff fee, nobody will agree more than that because the process itself is uh, quite clear. And people will say, why should I pay? And it's somehow it's a temporary process. They say, I don't want to pay more. But the, the important thing is that we also realize that a lot of the payment disputes actually end there. It stops. It doesn't go on. The number of arbitrations have dropped in the center, construction arbitrations. That is the immediate effect of what we have seen. That's what you all will see here also. I think in every jurisdiction, that's what happened. Construction arbitrations will slow down because everybody will take this fast uh, way of sorting it out. And then they will actually take time after that to decide which way they want to go. But uh, we are seeing that a slowdown in construction uh, arbitrations. So um, we talk about alternative fees. Now, uh, we have actually certified uh, 400, nearly 500 adjudicators through our training program. And ours is a statutory training program. Uh, it's prescribed in the regulation that to be an adjudicator in, in Malaysia under SIPA, you must have the following things. You must have a tertiary education. You must have seven years working experience in the construction industry. That means by way, and the qualification must be related to that. And then you must have a certificate in adjudication, which only KLRCA offers, but the minister has the discretion of recognizing other institutions. And then the, 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 the thing is, the other thing, you cannot be a bankrupt or be convicted of any offense. So these five things is a requirement of the adjudicator to be on the panel. So we have 477 uh, adjudicators trained. In fact, I think the last training that we did was in Kigali, Rwanda. It's a very interesting because we have a tie-up with Rwanda, and then I think Rwanda is looking into setting up a adjudication scheme. So they ask us to come and train, and we set the same exam that we set in uh, in Malaysia, uh, with a, a twist for uh, for East African practice, construction practice arrangements and their law, and uh, we found the percentage of passes was very good, about 60 percent. Eh? Very, very good. And then we have given them an entitlement to, to register, uh, to be empaneled in Malaysia, because that, that is your right. 
you can apply, but whether you get the work is different because you know, you're in East Africa, we can't give you work. You have to decide in Malaysia. So we, we get uh, a lot of people coming outside just to study, the, the to, to learn, to get the, the qualification. So um, now the other concern that I have is the composition of the professions of the adjudicators. We are not getting enough people from the building industry. I, I don't know why. Maybe, you know, we have majority of our, our adjudicators are lawyers. It's very unhealthy. I, I personally think that it, you all should try to avoid that. If you all should try to get a mix of, in fact, it should be more construction professionals because it's supposed to be a quick fix. It's supposed to be, you know, the people you should get is the engineers, the architects, and the quantity surveyors. They should be there because they are handling it hands on. You know. So, uh, but they don't seem to be coming on. You know, in fact, I think it's, one of the things is that I, I this is what I, I told the, the institutions. Uh, professions are tend to look at their core businesses because there are other people coming in, project managers, construction managers, and then the, the architect is just looking at himself or herself as a designer. Does not want to look at the at the contract administration part. The quantity surveyor is just looking, only doing accounts. Doesn't want to do the certification part. So I think that's that's where the, the thing. But very unhealthy. In fact, I'm 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 complaining about it. I'm making special effort to go out to the professions and telling them, please please come and train. You know? See, we charge for the training because you cannot give the training free. You have to charge for the training so that you value the training, and then you get paid. You know, or when you act as adjudicator. So, but. And lawyers seem to be very interested. I just get every batch we train, let's say we have about 30 people or 40 people, we get about three quarter of them are lawyers. So we, I'm, I'm spoiled for lawyers, but, but whenever we appoint, we try to appoint, we look at the dispute, if it's a bit technical, and uh, the argument about measurements and all these things, we try to put a quality surveyor, put an engineer in. Eh? But we, those guys are, oh, oh, now we're having a rotation system. So everybody will get a chance to, to to be an adjudicator. Now, I'll give you all some statistics. Huh? Uh, not many cases until now. Uh, we have about 100 over cases so far. Uh, uh, but as I said, over the last, uh, since the Court of Appeal ruled about uh, three weeks ago, uh, the retrospectivity of the act confirmed the High Court decision. Before that, people were still holding back. They all waited for the court of appeal. And I understand that it's not going up to the federal court, so it ends there. So it's all coming in now. So we're getting five a day. You know? So I'm assuming that this, these figures are just going to shoot up. Uh, again, what are the types of disputes that are coming in? We're getting about 30% final accounts, which is interesting. When, when I was actually, we were debating the act when we were drafting the act, I was very against final account being there. And uh, I said, you know, final accounts uh, is something that is done. The work, there's no more cash flow issue, you know, because the work is done. It's the last thing that's supposed to be done. But I think it's, uh, I, I admit I was wrong, because when the, when the statistics are now coming out, the first things are coming out, about 30% of our final account, then it's an issue. There is an issue, you know, with people not deciding final account. Professional payments, about 20%. Consultancy claims. Then uh, variations, 4% contract terms. Retention money, 2%. People are withholding money. And then the rest of it, interim payments. That is the kind of statistics we have. This, if I come back a year from now, I'm quite sure it's a bit different. Uh, I, I don't know how the, 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 the pie will look like. Uh. Um, actually, the, the thing is that uh, nobody, no, no claimant has lost la, so far analysis of the decision. No payment dispute has been dismissed completely. That means I think every payment dispute there is some element of a valid claim. So we are having either it's allowed in full or allowed partially. I think this is quite frightening for employers uh, who receive a, a payment claim. Uh. I think the, the, the advice would be now is to pay it or to settle it or to do some payment arrangements eh, rather than go through the entire process. If I was standing there and we are receiving a, a payment claim, because if you, if you go to adjudication, the statistics show that you are going to lose. Eh. So, and then now with cost follows event, how are you going to deal with that? Eh? 
because you're not only going to pay the, un, uh, the unpaid sum, you're also going to pay the financial cost, which is the interest. And then you have to pay the cost on top of that. And the cost includes uh, council fees, adjudicators' fee, and including preparing the claim. So it's quite a lot of money. Eh? So, and then I, I, the, we are still waiting now to see whether professionals are going to be uh, slapped with professional negligence suits in not certifying payments, certifying payments wrongly, or actually uh, delaying payments. So we don't know because you know the impact to the employer is quite great. Eh? Let's say so. Staff also have to be very careful. I think the the major contractors in our country, they have all set up compliance departments. They have started to work out uh, schemes and they have, uh, have a record arrangements. And uh, they have been some of them have been challenging the decision. For example, Benapuri, they have been testing every decision that goes against them. Eh? They go to court. Eh? Quite interesting. Eh? The, we have a number of decisions because it's still going on. The start was very, very slow. In fact, I thought nothing is going to happen. I said we might as well just pack the act away and forget it. You know, when we first started, we thought, we, you know, we went through this training process 2012. Before that, we started to train all these adjudicators. And then we, we, we had two training programs a year. Then we came down to one. And then uh, in, 2000, in uh, April 2015, uh, the act came, kicked in, and then nothing happened. It was all very quiet. Then one came in, another one came in. So we had a very few, you know, I think seven cases, eight cases, slowly. And of course now we've reached 100 cases, that's about uh, a year and a half since the act came into, into play. And uh, so I think it's still very early days. We can't, we can't really know the trend. I can just tell you all what we are seeing now. Uh, and then a lot of settlements. Huh? Applications withdrawn. You can see it. Somebody puts in, and then after that they withdraw it halfway. Uh, that's where the problem we have. We we also got caught where adjudicators don't get paid. They have started the work halfway through the process. They withdraw the application. They stop. So what we are now doing is that we are causing the adjudicators to collect the fee up front, so that we can apportion the fee to them for the work done. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's things that we are learning on the way. Disputed amounts, minimum is very small. The maximum is about 63 million. 63 million, we are talking about uh, how much in US. Uh, divide by four. Uh, currency has gone down. It's as bad as the rent. <laughs> the Malaysian ringgit. We have a scandal. Uh, I think our politicians are all terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I always say incorrect things, but you, know, you must forgive me. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the maximum amount is about 63 million divided by four at the present rate. At that, at that time, I think it would have been 3.2. So we would have about, let's say, for 15, 15, 12 million US, most probably a final account. That one was a final account. And then the smallest figure is about 8,000. So 8,000, we are talking about uh, a very small claim. You know, there is uh, something that is not paid, eh? and uh, the 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 amounts ordered, maximum ordered is 32 million, and then the 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 minimum amount for a case also there's been things like uh, 26 thousand. I, I I put these figures. Can give it to you all. The slides can be passed to them. Uh, there's no problem if you want. That. So you know, uh, it, it, I, I think it's meaningless. Uh, these figures are all meaningless because it's changing all the time. But whether there's a trend, I'm not, I'm not sure. Ah, construction adjudication. There is always this issue of other things, LEDs, extension of time, uh, non-completion. So the likely defences uh, of the respondent is going to be defective works. So they have to come out with a figure with that and they have to have some expert report or some kind of claim or some certification. And then, of course, non-completion, which is a set off. And then, again, you know, I, I mentioned that the jurisdiction of the adjudicator, parties can agree mutually to, to extend it, but we have not seen it happen. No party, because parties will never agree to extend when they are in, in a fight. Why should you actually say, I want you to decide a bit more when you are only supposed to decide that. And it is not a final process. Let's say if I'm a respondent, I will actually still 
fall back into arbitration if I need be or litigation if I'm not happy. But we, it is too early to say whether it's going to go that direction. Ours is an incomplete, uh, the, the scope of payment this, uh, claim is narrow. So there are a lot of items still left behind, especially the damages portion. So I think uh, that uh, has to be also, uh, I think maybe in about uh, two, three years' time, I can tell you all whether what is happening. Uh, we won't know until a bit later. Mm. So I, I, I think this, what has been happening, as I said, is that uh, most adjudicators are only using documents. Very few oral hearings. Even oral hearings, they hold it half a day, only ask some questions, and then they get the submissions. They set very strict timelines, and then they come back. And uh, uh, they, they do take witnesses, but very rarely. We hardly see any witnesses being called. Uh, you know, parties insist they want witnesses. The adjudicators say, I don't need it. Eh? And he's within his, uh, his right to say he doesn't need it because he's denying both of them. Eh? Uh, the, the thing. So, uh, I, I've talked about this, about payment, non-payment. The, the, the main thing about um, adjudicators, I've been telling them, if you do not agree to the fee, please resign. And also, the other thing is, let's say there is a jurisdictional challenge. The other way we are dealing with jurisdictional challenge is when you know it's clearly you've got no jurisdiction, you just resign. Now, the real, real problem comes to the center itself, under the default appointment, whether we can appoint an adjudicator. Sometimes the bug comes to us. Eh? And uh, when in doubt, the position that the center has taken, we appoint. We appoint. We do not make the decision. Because what we say doesn't really matter. It's what the adjudicator says. But let's say when the adjudicator is appointed and he realizes he doesn't have jurisdiction, we, we've been saying, you resign so that you don't go on. Because there seems to be a suggestion in English case that if you know that you have no jurisdiction and you go on, you may be liable for the losses eh, that the party suffers. So it's a bit more complex than uh, what we think it is eh, because the English law is developed uh, quite clearly and it will be applicable. So we've been telling, you know, if you're not sure, but where the appointing authority is concerned, unless it's clear-cut, no, no jurisdiction, let's say it doesn't fall under the exemption order or it falls under section three, we will not appoint. But other than that, it's not clear. We will, we, will, we will appoint and let the adjudicator deal with it. And if the adjudicator is very, very clear that he should not go on, he should just resign and leave it open. So then we can look at why he has resigned and deal with it. Uh, section 18, cause follows event. I've already talked about Then So the adjudicator must do it. We have regulation that uses the common law arrangement on cause that you can look at the circumstances. Let's say you don't want to give cause follows event. Then you can look at the circumstances, whether the other party has behaved very badly, uh, have, have concealed things or taken uh, a tremendous uh, um, amount of time. Uh, and I think that is the usual thing. So you can ask for cause submissions. Uh, uh, timelines are very strict. Uh, Parties normally ask for extension. That's what we notice. The adjudicators normally don't ask for extension. It's the parties who are asking for extension. And uh, when the adjudicator asks for an extension, uh, it is normally to render his decision. And uh, one of the things that we discourage adjudicators from doing is to ask for extension to render their decision. That is why we have, uh, we have instituted a, 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 a sort of like a pop-up arrangement to remind the adjudicator that he must come out with his decision. So a week before, we will tell the adjudicator, your time is up in a week's time. Please remember to submit your adjudication. In fact, yesterday, my colleague, as I said, sent out a message for a decision coming out today. He said, you know, we are, are you rendering your decision coming out today? You know, so that the adjudicator knows for sure that that is the value that we add to the process for the administration fee that we, we take. Uh, I think I've talked about this. Now, adjudication proceedings are confidential. Uh, again, you know, you, can, uh, you cannot actually bring anybody into, into, the, into the process itself who is not related to, to, adjudication, uh, to the adjudication. And we, we talked about multiple parties. In fact, what is happening? We are having situations 
where there are three payment claims coming in, same parties, one go, and same contract, sometimes different contracts. So we have an arrangement on how to appoint. There will be a discussion in the centre on who should be appointed or whether the same adjudicator should be appointed. Uh, this, this is some of the things that we try to, so that there's a consistency in the decision making. Our time of service, again, you know, uh, whether the, the problem with the Act, the Act doesn't allow modern way of doing things. <laughs> it's still, you have to serve hard copy. That's terrible, you know. Everything is done by email, but everything now, the real copies, everything is hard copy. So I think that's something we have to look at, you know. Uh, in fact, I would suggest that if you are coming up with your regulations, you should allow some kind of email authenticity, or authenticated email arrangements, because that's the fastest way to a quick process. So you must have a, a modern way of doing things. When they did this, this is drafted by a lawyer, so he still wanted the old way of doing things. So he's still serving hard copies. Uh, my, my country is very big. I have two parts to my country, East Malaysia and West Malaysia. So we are now talking about setting up offices. If the numbers are going to be, I'm going to set up a branch of KLRC just to handle adjudication cases. In fact, uh, we are going to set it up in East Malaysia, and we are also going to set up in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Penang and Johor. And then in East Malaysia, maybe two places, Sarawak, which will be uh, Kuching and, uh, and uh, Kota Kinabalu. So it's, it's because of the service provisions. Uh. If it's, let's say, by emails, then it will all come in straight to center. Isn't it? We can acknowledge. Because the document, the decision must be actually a, a, a written decision on a document, which is, uh, cannot by, by, by email. But I think you all have to look at that. Lah. The one, I'm, I'm going to try to change it if, if we can do an amendment to the act. The retrospectivity, I've told you all. Uh, our certification programs, we are uh, uh, the, the default appointing authority under the Act, and so we need to set the competency standards. I've already told you all what we have required. Uh, basically, is that we have our training program. I, I should give you all a copy. If you all are setting up a training program, I want to share that, that training program with you all, because our program is quite uh, uh, comprehensive five days. Four days, we have uh, uh, six units, and we will train them by way of, uh, let's say, for example, uh, what is adjudication? We talk about the, the statute itself, then we go through the regulations, we go through the, 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 the rules, yeah. then we talk about, let's say, for non lawyers, there will be a component for law, natural justice, what it means, disclosure requirements, independence and impartiality, what does that mean? And then for, uh, for, for lawyers, some component of construction. And then, then the most important thing is then we have decision writing. So the exam that we have is two parts of it. In the morning, we will have multiple choice questions you, where you, you, you pick an answer. And if you answer, pick the wrong answer, you get a, a proportion of your marks deducted. And then uh, in the afternoon, we have a problem that is given, and you write a full decision. Now, the f our analysis of the thing, a lot of people just pass the multiple choice questions. Uh, of course, the bad ones fail both. La. <laughs> so you don't have to. So you, they, 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 uh, they, 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 the good ones uh, will pass both, but uh, it's quite, quite normal for people to fail the decision writing uh, because it's, it is actually, a, 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 it's like a writing an award, arbitration award, and the training is on that. That is the key to the, the entire process. The, what we do also is to uh, have a strict, uh, you're allowed to sit one more time, just for the exam. Let's say if you, if you fail the exam. If you fail both papers, then you don't bother. Uh, you, can, you have to sit for both papers. But if you, let's say, pay, fail one paper, then you're allowed to sit for the exam one more time. But if you fail again, then you repeat the course. So, so far we have been having about 60-70% uh, passes rates. Uh, I suppose those people who fail, uh, they realize that they have to actually work on it more. Some of them do come back and sit again. I have at least about three, three persons who have failed, sat again, failed, and then come back, sat and got through. Uh, I, I, I think uh, we, are, we are not, uh, but the only thing is that there is an investment involved, is it time, 
and then you because you have failed you also affects your 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 self esteem <laughs> so so you know especially older people we are expecting people from industry you know you have, you have not been uh, let's say you've been people we are getting some of them 20 years in industry no, we are not getting young people yeah? we are getting older people so get them to put them through an exam I feel a, a lot of empathy uh, how difficult it is uh, but we have no choice because it's new skills that you have to learn uh, it's a different set of skills that you have to know so uh, so we have well, five units sorry five units we did one in Kigali. I'm very proud of this. This, uh, this the arrangement. We, we, I, I sent uh, my, my trainers over there. Uh, we did a lot of road shows, and then we have every year we have a conference uh, on SIPA, which you are welcome to attend. We, which originally I gave it away free, so I'll get a thousand over people coming. Uh, but uh, now I, I charge 300 ringgit, and so I still get about about 400 people coming. Still, it's a, it's a very big conference because the minister will open one whole day. Uh, and we will debate, uh, we will get foreign uh, uh, speakers to come in uh, and uh, normally we will go through the issues. So this is uh, the conference that we did this year. The other thing that we are now doing is that we are now doing workshops uh, on how to draft claims, how to draft responses. We found that this is actually quite useful. See, a lot of uh, uh, people in the industry, they don't want to be adjudicators. It's just too difficult for them. But they want to know how to draft a claim, how to actually deal with a response. Uh, they want to know how do adjudicators think. How does an adjudication decision look like? So we have been doing this kind of courses now. We find the response is quite quite good. Eh? So we have these workshops and uh, it's, I, I, I think, uh, I, I, should I comment about the South Africa? <laughs> I, I, I don't really know, but I think it's similar in many ways. Only thing is yours is a set of regulations. I don't know how far the regulations can go uh, where it comes to core things like uh, uh, whether you can set out everything in a regulation. And I doubt it. And can, can you all do that? I don't know. I, we, maybe we can talk about it later in, the, in, the, in question and answer. Uh, Okay, now I want to conclude my talk today. Thank you very much for listening to me. I, I'm, I think we all must be quite tired already. I feel tired too. <laughs> uh, is that um, it's actually dependent on the key people uh, who are in the industry. And one of the, uh, the buy-ins that we had is that early days we had buy-ins from actually contractors and also the employer. The employer organizations kept still. They didn't do anything but the contracting organizations, and then the professions became very, very active. Now, there was a debate at one point, a very, very interesting debate, uh, that, that lawyers should be excluded from the representing in the adjudication process. Uh, I mean, uh, you, should, you should have seen almost fisticuffs were there. You know? <laughs> the, you know, the, because the lawyers were up in arms. You know? They say this is a constitutional right to represent you know, and earn a living. <laughs> so, but you see, the, one of the things that, uh, and this was actually proposed by the uh, Malaysian Institute of Architects. Uh, they said, look, you know, uh, the, the, the thing is being over lawyered. Uh, it is becoming too legalistic. Uh, we propose that uh, where this new process is involved, uh, uh, lawyers should not be allowed. A very, uh, the response, of course, from the lawyers was completely negative. Uh, and the, the Institute of Architects brought up a scheme, which is in, in Malaysia, called under POREM, Palm Oil Refinery uh, Arbitration Rules. They have, you know, when you sell, we, we produce a lot of palm oil. So they all have standard form of contracts in the palm oil, and they have a set of rules that refer to under the institution. And if you arbitrate under that institution, lawyers are not allowed to represent. And it works quite well because the people who decide is industry people. So the institutional architects basically said, look, this is an industry thing. We shouldn't have lawyers involved. It should be decided by industry people. You can train and all these things, but when you represent, it should be only the parties. And of course, in POREM, the way they, they, the parties circumvent it is that they employ in-house lawyers who go there, supported by outside lawyers who prepare all the documentations. Mm. 
So the lawyers are still there, but only thing they never appear. Uh, so it, you know, I, I, in fact, uh, that, that was the argument also put up uh, that you know it is it is something that is convoluted. Uh, it is uh, not clear. It's better to see your your opponent huh, and and deal with it. So uh, the the other thing that's adjudication authority. Uh, we have to play the honest broker, and that's where the difficulty is. You know, uh, I, I think that you know sometimes we have our views. You know, I have my own views on how the system should work, and uh, we find that it is sometimes at odds. For example, if I have to deal with the minister and he wants an exemption, and if I say no, uh, which I've said no, you know, you 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 a little bit of tension when your renewal comes about. Eh? <laughs> I'm just telling you all, you know, but we do, you know, I mean, you, sometimes you take a stand and you do that, you know, but whether it happens or not. But I can imagine the, the, the kind of difficulties that you, you, you do have uh, as, a, as, as an authority and then dealing with parties and also dealing with, uh, with, with the uh, authorities that you work with. But I think one of the things that are uh, very important is that you have to actually make adjudication into a system that is part of the entire process. And it must be actually a workable system. And more importantly, there must be credibility in it. You know, so you must weed out, I feel, bad hats. And you must be unforgiving. If, let's say if your adjudicator is actually, you see, I remember I got Chow Kok Fong to come and speak at our first conference from Singapore. And he was quite surprised that Malaysia was going to have an adjudication system. And he was telling me uh, in private that he says that the four countries that have an adjudication system are all developed economies with a high level of transparency. Then I told him, you know, that's what we want. You know? uh, 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 competent economy with a high level of transparency. Because payment is about that. Eh? When you don't pay people, you are actually not being honest you're not being transparent, and you're actually c causing inefficiency. Is it? So I think that that is coming from a Singaporean who they pride themselves are very efficient and they do things very, very straight and they make sure that things work. Uh, in, and I said, you know, we are part of it. Like, and so, so I think South Africa is going to join that, that group of people. That's what uh, I think prompt payment and construction uh, security of payment uh, legislation is about. Eh? Thank you very much. Eh?